Welcome back to our module on Frontiers of the Future. In this last session, we're going to be exploring one other practice that has been developed over the last years for working with the energetic architecture that we've been describing. So in the previous one, we were looking at a, a process that involved balancing that energetic architecture over a longer period of time, you know, six months to a year, with uh, measurements and interventions and requires a significant amount of training uh, to work in that area. This one <clears throat> is more about working with the energetic architecture day by day. And it's something you can pick up and start working with immediately. So as you're listening, just get a feel for, is this something that you feel uh, you'd like to pick up and explore? Uh, if, you, if you do, you can check out more on their website or find more in our resources. So I'll just give you enough now so you've got a sense of what it's basically about. So this is called Co-Creative Science. It was developed by a woman called Michelle Smallwright. Uh, she was inspired by some of the things she experienced at a place called Findhorn in Scotland, which is an intentional community where people had come to live together in sustainable lifestyles. And they'd been working with local agriculture and growing their vegetables there. And then found when they started working more consciously in this kind of a way with the energetic architecture, that they got these super big vegetables and suddenly they were vitalizing their garden in all sorts of ways and winning all sorts of competitions with the quality of their produce. So when she saw that, when she came back to her home in America, she started experimenting and developing a methodology for working with the energetic architecture in her gardens. And then after uh, some time, she realized that the principles that she was applying and the way she was working with the garden, which was working extremely well, would also be a, a quick, applicable to, for example, organizations or communities, what she ended up calling soilless gardens. Because she said her concept was that anything which is created by people, we can think of as a garden. It's not uh, wild nature, but it's something which we've shaped and formed over time that we then need to tend to as a garden, even if it's an organization. <clears throat> so she's developed a set of practices which help you to connect to different dimensions within the energetic architecture here. There is a book she's written called Co-Creative Science. And one of the things I found amazing about Michelle's work is the clarity of her language. So I'd just like to share with you one of some of her basic definitions to give you a feel for how she's framing things and trying to find appropriate language to describe some of these dimensions that we're not used to talking to each other about. She says, nature intelligence is the organizing dynamic between the form of that life and its soul. So we could think like we were talking last time about the two triangles, the top triangle being its soul and the form of that life being the bottom triangle and looking at the integration of those two, that the nature intelligence is the process that brings those together, the integration of those two. She goes on to say, it is the order, organization, and life vitality of all form. The order, organization, and life vitality of all form. Those were three dimensions that we touched on uh, looking at the ecotherapy process. There is structure and order to the system and there's life energy in the system. There's the, the way it forms and shapes itself. This nature intelligence is an organizing flow from the soul to a physical focal point and it flows through the form. Really about the integration of, these, of the energetic and the material again. When humans consider solutions for restoring balance to an out-of-balance world, they need only access the intelligence of nature involved for answers. That intelligence contains inherent balance and is fully capable of defining all that is required for reflecting that inherent balance through specific form. So what she's suggesting here is that as we look to integrate these different dimensions and design in the material world our organizational forms or our gardens, that the knowing of how to do that in the way that is most aligned with the basic principles of life is held in this energetic architecture, is held through what she would call the nature intelligence. 
And remember what we were saying about the scientists only understanding 4% of reality and that there was all this stuff in the 96% that we didn't yet understand. What well, she's suggesting and through her experience sees that many of the answers around how to create appropriate designs for life are held in those dimensions. And the, and the process she's developed is one way of accessing those. She goes on to say, from nature's perspective, everything is in order. To work with nature intelligence, one must learn to access it in an orderly fashion that meets the needs of our own intelligence. For example, you must devise mutually agreed upon codes. A language must be developed that contains mutually agreed upon definitions. So we saw this in the ecotherapy that there was a shared language that we were developing, understanding different levels at the concept, concept level, at the um, manifestation level, at the concept level. There were the, uh, the grounding and the bovies that were working at the ideas level. So all sorts of different language that we developed to be able to access different dimensions of the energetic realm and quite a, a strong structure to it so that um, as we engage in these practices, we have a discipline working in a similar way and uh, Michelle Small Wright's point is that's what you need to have an agreement, as it were, with the invisible dimensions so that people know what we're talking about. And she's developed a certain language, a certain code and certain practices um, that help to do that. Now, it's just one approach and you could develop a different code. But the point is you do need to have some kind of agreed structure or order that can give that more subtle energy form in the material world. She goes on to say, Based on your definition, direction, and purpose, nature creates the order, organization, and life vitality, patterns and rhythms that will best respond to the information you have supplied. So if you look at the image that's on here as well, where it says involution and evolution, what her perspective is, is that the role of the human being is to exercise our free will to choose which direction we're going, to have clear intention about where we're wanting to go. And that the nature intelligence knows how to give that form, how to find a way to turn our intention into a form that is most resonant with life's basic principles. So when we make our choice, it's not up for, uh, to us if we just start thinking about how to try to do it ourselves and we don't connect to this other intelligence we're likely to create forms that aren't necessarily aligned with the basic principles of life. And one might say that's one of the main reasons that we've created some of the mess that we have because we lost our connection to that dimension of reality when we moved into the more scientific, rational way of thinking about things. So here are a number of steps that we can take to work with this. It's a very practical hands-on. In the website, you can find uh, a handbook of how to do it, but it's really very simple. <clears throat> the first thing you have to do for a project that you're working on is create the direction, the definition, and the purpose of what you're doing. So what that means is definition, define what the project is. Okay, this is my garden, or it's my department in the organization, or it's the community that I live in. Define it. Like in the ecotherapy, you need to create a boundary, define a boundary within which to work with. And then the direction. Which way, where are we going? What's the goal? Where are we trying to get to? Like you'll see in the ecotherapy as well, we talked about the need to have goals set for a year. Like when you go to the doctor and say, hey, I'm wanting to climb Mount Everest. Could you give me a checkup? I want to be doing it in a year. They're likely to give you very different information than if you just come for a general checkup and say, oh, okay, you want to climb Mount Everest. Well, uh, you'll need to do these and these and these things. So your checkup about your fitness in the present moment is directly related to where you want to be in the future. The same way here, when you define your direction, you're saying to those invisible dimensions, this is where I want to be. And in that context, how do we start to move forward together? And the purpose, so the why, the bigger meaning for why it is that you're wanting to do what you're doing. So when you create those, that's what helps to define the boundary of the project that you're working on and, and give some clarity in time and space to what it is that you're actually inviting 
the energetic architecture into. So once you've got that clarity, you then set up what she calls a coning, C-O-N-I-N-G. And I see it as a kind of meeting space. It's a space that you create to connect to different dimensions that exist in the energetic architecture to work together with you on your project. Now, she's works with certain language that we may be familiar with or we may not be familiar with. In my understanding, the way I think of it is this language just defines different functions in the energetic architecture. Different, uh, like in our body, we have uh, the liver and we have the heart and we have the kidney and they all have a role to play in our body. At the same time, Uh, In the same way, there will be different organs or functions in the energetic architecture, and we've given them certain language. And here, she's chosen to call them the devas, and the devas, she says, are the function of creating a blueprint of uh, where we're going to be in the end. So when we've created our direction, definition, and purpose, this devic function is to create the blueprint um, from which we can then design the reality in 3D. And then she would talk about Pan and the nature spirits. And she sees that as the function of translating this blueprint, this design into form in our real 3D world here. And she says that's the axis, the involutionary axis of taking the intention that we have, turning it into a blueprint, a design and bringing it into form. So that's why in this coning process, in our meeting, you invite in both the deva and you invite in the nature spirits because they have key functions or roles to play in that work. On the other axis at the top, she has what she names the white brotherhoods, also the white sisterhood people will refer to. And that points to a certain uh, function of seeing the bigger picture of humanity's direction. So where are we going on our bigger journey? A perspective which just from our position here on earth we may not be able to see, but an understanding in that 96% of the invisible reality that can see more of the direction that everything is moving in the universe than we can actually comprehend from our perspective here. So that helps because that's also about directionality, about the choice, the intention of where we want to go. And then the fourth Uh, part or element that we invite into these meetings, into these conings, is our own higher self. So you could say our own higher knowing, our sense of purpose, our, our sense of who we are in a bigger perspective. So we invite all of these elements into what she calls the coning. And in this coning, you can have conversations. You can explore what it is you want to be doing. So saying, okay, I'm working on the garden today. I'm thinking about this and that. You know, I'd like some information about whatever it is you have to ask. And the way you can get that information is through some of the body-based knowing that we talked about in the previous modules. So that can be the kinesiology, the muscle testing, where you look at when your muscles go strong or weak in answer to a question, or some of the dowsing with a pendulum, which we also remember see as just an extension of the movements of the electrical system within our body in response to questions that we have. So you can find out more about the dowsing and things through the Perilandra process, how to learn it and develop it. Um, But those are the ways that we gather the information and that we communicate with um, these different functions within the energetic architecture. So as you're working, you know, she has a workbook with all sorts of different kinds of interventions that you can make. So you can go down a checklist and say, based on where we are this week, you know, and where we want to be in the longer term, I'd like to achieve this this week. Is there anything we need to do? And some of them are, for example, about cleaning energy. Some are about making different connections. Uh, Some are about using different essences, different flower essences that have a certain energetic frequency that can help boost the system, bring more energy into it. There's a whole list of choices. And you can ask what the best thing would be now for the system and then implement it. So it's a very easy practice that you can start developing uh, immediately rather than something that requires a significant amount of training. So I'd invite you just to see if this kind of makes sense to you or you want to start exploring it. Look at some of the other resources, explore their website, play with it maybe on one of your projects or even on your creative assignment, for example. Uh, You could experiment with working with this approach on your assignment and see how that 
works. It's very good to start small. If you want to start working with this, experiment with something small. Don't make it your whole life plan or this massive organization. Start with a little project that you're working on, maybe even your garden at home, and notice how that starts to work. Get familiar with the language. Get familiar um, with working with this uh, dimension to reality. So that's the end of this session and brings us to the end of this module, exploring some of the frontiers of the future, some of the things that we probably don't normally get to hear about in our MBA or even undergraduate education, uh, things that are really coming at us from the future now. Important because as we're in this transition, we know that the kind of future that's emerging is something that's going to look radically different to our current reality. We know that from the dynamics of emergence that we've been talking about as the caterpillar, for example, shifts to the butterfly. So the fact that we're now talking about things that don't necessarily match our current frameworks makes sense in the context of this kind of change. And there are many, many uh, other practices that are emerging very quickly at this time. So I'd invite you to do a little bit of exploration yourself into what are some of the, some of the new ways of thinking, some of the new ways of doing things that really sounds uh, very strange to a normal ear based on our current understanding, but are actually beginning to gain traction that have been researched, that are beginning to show us that reality actually looks a bit different to the way we've traditionally understood it. So that brings us to the end of the module. Uh, I'd invite you to um, look at how you can integrate some of this through the tasks and um, take up some of your personal development modules. Maybe this has informed uh, you in terms of which pieces you'd like to start working on yourself a little bit more. And, uh, and have a vibrant and healthy discussion about these issues uh, in the student forums.